Hey everybody, welcome back to the Feynman Technique. Um, it's been a while since I've made a video, and I hope you guys enjoy this one. Today we're going to be taking a look at this. Um, I is equal to, I is what we're calling our integral, the integral from 0 to infinity of cosine tx over x squared plus 1 all squared dx. Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry. I jumped the gun there. It's just cosine x, not cosine tx. That co The tx, the introduction of the parameter t, comes in the next step. So, um, let's go ahead and reparameterize our integral. We'll call some f of t equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of cosine tx over x squared plus 1 all squared dx. And we'll note that f of 0 is equal to pi over 4. Now, that's not a super easy integral to evaluate. If we evaluate our function at the point t is equal to 0, we'll get the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over x squared plus 1 all squared dx. That does evaluate to pi over 4. And, you know, if you're watching this channel, that's probably something you could work out yourself. Uh, so I'm not going to show it. Furthermore, if we evaluate our f at uh, t is equal to 1, we just recover our original integral. All right, so now let's um, use the Leibniz rule for differentiation under the integral sign to find f prime of t. That's going to be equal to negative integral 0 to infinity of x sine tx over x squared plus 1 all squared dx. And let's note that f prime of 0 equals 0. All right, now let's continue on to f double prime of t. f double prime of t will be equal to negative integral 0 to infinity of x squared, and I'm going to leave a little space here, cosine tx over x squared plus 1 all squared dx. Then I'm going to add a little parentheses around this x squared and introduce a plus 1. All right, what did we do by introducing that plus 1? Well, we subtracted this. We subtracted uh, the integral from 0 to infinity of cosine tx over x squared plus 1 all squared dx, which it so happens is our original f of t. So, since we subtracted f of t, we need to add it back in order to preserve our original equation. Okay, so now we can see that this x squared plus 1 will disappear and this squared sign will disappear. All right. Um, in a video from a long time ago, uh, during the process of solving that integral right here without the squared, um, part of the process involved showing this, that this integral right here without the minus sign actually evaluates to pi over 2 times e to the negative t for t values uh, greater than or equal to 0. So, this integral, the integral from 0 to infinity of cosine tx over x squared plus 1 dx for t greater than or equal to 0, actually perfectly evaluates to pi over 2 times e to the negative t. So, pi over 2 times e to the negative t. And let's refine this equation a little bit. We're going to say that f double prime of t minus f of t is equal to negative pi over 2 e to the negative t. So I'm going to go ahead and erase that. Hopefully I remember what I just said. Yeah. We know that f double prime of t minus f of t is equal to pi over 2, sorry, negative pi over 2 times e to the negative t. Okay. Well, um, 
that's this is probably the most difficult differential equation I've ever featured on this channel. It's a second order differential equation and it's non homogeneous. Um, so that means there's a lot of work that goes into solving this the normal way. We're just going to kind of, we're going to use a combination of cleverness and our initial conditions to, to come up with something that satisfies this differential equation. All right. So I don't care what anybody says. Um, our f of t is going to contain some constant a times e to the negative t. Now, that won't be the entire thing, but that's definitely going to be part of it. That is for sure going to be part of our differential equation. Because this is because we get something, we get, we get a constant factor of e to the negative t out of that. And we know that successive derivatives of e to the negative t flip flop um, uh, between e to the negative t and e to the t. Um, okay. Well, where do we go from here? We know that our f evaluated at zero has to equal pi over four. Okay, so let's just make our a pi over four, how about? That will at least, now our f of t at least satisfies the condition f of zero equals pi over four. All right, but it doesn't satisfy f prime of zero equals zero. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to introduce another part to the function. This part is going to be, we'll just call it for now, g of t. All right, well, if this is our f of t, what's our f prime of t? If this was the form of our f of t, um, then our f prime of t would be pi over 4 times e to the negative t times g prime of t minus pi over 4 times e to the negative t times g of t. Well, now let's set f prime of 0 equal to 0. All right, so we're evaluating f prime at the point t is equal to 0. So we're going to get pi over 4 g prime of 0 minus pi over 4 g of 0 equaling 0. All right, we can divide both sides of that equation by pi over 4, no problem. So we need our g of t to be such that g prime evaluated at 0 minus g evaluated at 0 is equal to 0. One function comes to mind right off the bat, and that's g of t is equal to e to the t. Now, that's not our g of t. That will not work. And the reason is, notice that if our g of t was equal to e to the t, then our f of t would be equal to pi over 4, and that's ridiculous. It's not going to be pi over 4. That, that would break our equation. Okay, so our g of t has got to be some other function g of t, such that g prime of 0 minus g of 0 is equal to 0. Now, I'm not sure uh, what the proper way to go about uh, coming up with that function is, but if, if you just think about it for a little while, our, the, the function g of t that would satisfy g prime of 0 minus g of 0 is equal to 0 is g of t is equal to t plus 1. Because if you take g prime of t, you just end up with 1. 1 evaluated at 0 is still 1. And g evaluated at 0 is also 1. So g prime of 0 minus g of 0 is equal to 0. So that's our g of t. And let's just go ahead and replace our g of t with t plus 1. And then since we solved this differential equation in a non-rigorous way, um, what you should do next is go ahead and verify it. Go ahead and verify that it satisfies this. It does. It does satisfy that. Not only that, but it satisfies the initial conditions also. Um, I thought that was a pretty clever way of coming up with our uh, f of t without going through the... Um, 
you know, the, the pain in the butt process of actually solving that differential equation the proper way. All right, but let's get back to our, to solving our integral. All that's left to do is plug in t is equal to one into our f of t and we get our integral. And, and that is the answer to our, um, our problem. Okay, so if we evaluate our f of t at t is equal to one, we find that i is simply pi over two e. Let me make a correct box there. All right. Well, that's the answer, guys. And what I found kind of interesting is take a look at our original integral. In a previous video, I solved that integral without the squared. And it turns out that is also equal to pi over 2 e. Pi over 2. Uh, okay. It's not pi over 2 times e. It's pi over 2 e. Okay, and so is this integral right here. That's also equal to pi over 2e. I, th I thought that was kind of cool, that introducing that squared right there, if you just square the um, the numer uh, yeah, the denominator, it doesn't change the value of that integral at all. I thought that was really cool. I hope you guys did too, and I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll see you next time.